Welcome back to Thirsty Thursday with Reggie Narito and Angie N. Yes, as you can see, Reggie's not here right now because if you watch our last video, you will probably heard Reggie say that he liked to taste the wine without seeing the label first. Then that's how he can give a better assessment of the quality and the taste of the wine without having any kind of idea of what the wine is. So today I'm actually going to stir him kind of a curveball, but not really because this wine, for those of you who have been following me for a while, you know this is one of my favorite California Cabernet and one of the most popular one. This is our 2018 Bjorn Cabernet. I have done a couple interview and tasting with Bjorn before. It's one of my favorite California Cabernet. They only make about 250 cases of it and it's located on Howe Mountain and his wine consistently Wine tastes better than wines that's three times the price as them. And I guarantee you Reggie has never tasted this wine before just because it's such a tiny little family produced Cabernet. So we're going to go ahead and open it and I'm going to invite him back in and we're going to see if he can get that it is Cabernet. I think that part should be easy. A California Cabernet, it is made very classic in uh, style, varietal and, and all that good stuff. 2018 is not considered one of your off vintage. So I think he'll be able to call that as well. But I just am curious to see his opinion on the quality and the taste of the wine and see if he agree with the many, many of my clients who have had taste this wine and loved it before. All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to pour him a nice healthy blind taste and myself as well. So he hasn't seen the bottle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cork it and I'm going to hide it back in a wine box. We have a wine box that's completely not related so I can reveal it to him later. So this is nice and corked. I'm hiding it in here and I'm actually going to put it underneath the table so he doesn't see it. All right. Okay. I think we're good. We're going to get Reggie in now. Hey, Reggie, come on in. All right. As you requested, you say you like to enjoy wine without knowing the label and the price. So it is com completely blind and fair. So let's give it a go. Mm. Um, the wine's unfiltered um, because I see some separation between the edge and it looks granular. So I'm going to tilt this over towards me and I'm going to get, and it's, it's a fairly thick skinned grape variety. I know that maybe it's not a single grape variety. Maybe it might be a blend of one primary grape and then small, all smaller amounts of some other one, but it looks like to be a, a deep ruby, almost to medium purple in the middle. So it's got some, uh, some color in there, but then on the edge, I get a little bit of variation in color. So it's not as much as that burgundy that we had earlier, but I do get a little bit of separation there. So like four to six years, but it's a thin watery band. So there's some alcohol in there. So, but this is a medium plus intensity of color, mm. pushing high, but not quite. And immediately I see the tearing. So unlike the burgundy, where we have to kind of coax the tearing, yeah. um, I see the tearing immediately and the tears are well formed and they're slow. So to me, this is definitely on the higher side of alcohol. Can you explain to our viewer what this tearing means? Because I feel like there's still a lot of uh, myth around what tear means in the wine. Well, first of all, I'll tell you what tearing is not. Tearing is not a sign of quality no. because all wines will show tearing to some level or another. All right. The question is, is whether uh, the tearing is fast and diffuse or whether they're well formed and slow. And in this case, they're well formed and slow. So tearing can tell you a couple of things. Number one, it could tell you that there's a presence of alcohol and the more the alcohol there is, the slower the tears will sheet down the glass. Mm -hmm. The less alcohol, the faster it will sheet down the glass. And also, it could also tell you that possibly that there's the presence of sweetness, of sugar. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that tearing can tell me. So, but this to me is high alcohol, and then I'm going to hold it against a white background, and I see light purple staining. So there's color in the tears, so this adds to my thought that this is a thick skin grape variety. So nothing, this is not Pinot Noir, this is not Grenache, and this is not Sangiovese. I already know that, right, just by looking at the wine. So now I'm gonna smell this wine. 
I pick up three things. I pick up dark, dark and red fruit. I pick up blackberries, definitely black currants. This is strong black currants. And I pick up a cassis note in here. Cassis is more like a liqueur kind of red fruit. The black currants are very strong in this wine. And almost to me, and being a kid that ate a lot of candy when I was a little <laughs> kid, it smells a lot like purple licorice. Oh, yeah. It yeah. smells a lot like purple licorice. And it's very deep. I also pick up what I consider to be some herbs, some green herbs that are not dried. They're more like sage and thyme, a little bit of like a violet note. So it's very deep, very deep and rich. In terms of concentration, I'd say it's borderline high. So a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say it's around a 9. I think that there are also some, some clove and baking spice notes here, particularly clove, um, a little bit of cinnamon stick. So I think that this wine has seen some oak aging, and it would not surprise me if there are some new oak notes. There's no real earthiness here. Let's, let's taste the wine. This wine is rich. It's full-bodied, consistent with what I had smelled. The cassis, the black currant, the black berry, the fresh herbs, the sage, the thyme. There's a violet, pretty light violet note in there. So the herbs are there, the violets. The oak is not as prevalent to me on the palate as it was on the nose. Got it. Nice. So I do not pick up as much of that. So maybe I'm going to back up, back off a little bit of my claims on the oak. So maybe not 40%, maybe 30, 25% new, but it's that clove, that baking spice, cardamom still comes in with this, this wine. I'm curious to know what kind of oak they're using and what toast level, because it, it to me, it might be a higher toast level, but maybe not as high because that clove only comes over to me when there's a higher toast level. But I don't really get a lot of that toast component either. Going over the structure component, the wine is, is bone dry. Nice. This wine does not come across like a cherry lifesaver, which <laughs> some Cabernet or some producers of Zinfandel or Syrah might do. I don't get that. Mm -hmm. The acidity is medium high. It's actually kind of surprising once you swallow the wine because right after that, the acidity comes through and it keeps it very fresh on its feet. The, I'm going to try this again on the alcohol. It's coming right about here. So to me, this could be around 14% alcohol, maybe even a little bit higher, but 14% alcohol. So this mean, this confirms what I saw yes. on the uh, tearing there of where I said it had color in the tears and also was slow, meaning higher levels of alcohol. 14% to me is right on the threshold between medium plus and high. By the way, I want to pause there. What Reggie was doing to kind of feel the alcohol in, 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 in the wine is he swallows a little bit and he feels how far it burns down his throat. So most of us hopefully have the experience of being 21 at some point and taking a shot of a hard liquor tequila or vodka or whatever have you. If you remember that, once you take a shot of something that's 40%, it will burn all the way down to your stomach. But when you're just drinking like a Mike's Hard Lemonade or something that's really light, a White Claw nowadays, Mike's Hard Lemonade, I'm showing my age. Okay, white claw <laughs> nowadays, that's five percent alcohol. It, it barely touches the bottom of your throat. So that's kind of hit our a lot of our um, tasters gauge on how high alcohol is is to see how far it burns down your throat. And so you know, alcohol drives body, which is what I've always been taught. This is a full-bodied wine. It has a full-flavored finish. If I were to describe this wine, I would say it's a full-bodied red wine that exhibits red and dark fruit. Um, has some wonderful fresh herb and clove notes of oak with a really long finish. I think that this is a really nice wine. Okay, but we need you to tell us what you think it is. Year, vintage, region, varietal, and all that good stuff. I'm thinking that it's a Cabernet-based blend from somewhere. It's not going to be Australia. It could be in California somewhere. Uh, because of the higher acid, I, I'm going to say that this is um, primarily Cab. Nice. Um, because Cab tends to have higher acid than some of the other Bordelais grape varieties. I would say that this particular vintage, this particular wine, because it has higher level of acid, would be Napa Valley, but closer to Carneros. 
Um, so you could say on the other side, maybe Soda Springs, you should, could say maybe Yonville, somewhere mm -hmm. around there, mm -hmm. um, but not quite going up towards Oakville Let's or um, some of those other ones. So Soda Springs is kind of like around where the Stags Leap District is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, you know, that's um, it extends pretty far down. And then Yonville, of course, one full step away from Carneros. Right. So that would be my guess. Cab based blend from one of the cooler areas in Napa, um, high quality. Vintage? I think it's got 2016. 2016, oh, price point. How about, I mean, I know last night you should think, but where would you think this falls, the price point? Um, I think that this is very consistent with what I see right now for Napa Valley bottlings of what I see out in retail, go anywhere from like $50, 50 to 75, $80 a bottle. So I think anything in that price point would be what I would consider because the wine has oak, the wine has quality of fruit. Awesome. Are you ready to see what it is? Sure. I had it hiding under the table. One second. All right. There it is. Have you ever had this wine before? Oh, so he's, it's a mountain wine. It is a mountain wine, which actually also apply, correct? Like when you're cooler, talking, cooler region. Like I didn't consider that. You know what? That, that's... I didn't talk about the tannin in this one because the tannin actually comes through with the acidity pretty good. Right. So I, I, I mean, I would consider the tannin to be medium full. Right. Which is kind you of know what this kind of reminds me of? This kind of reminds me of Randy Dunn's stuff. Oh, nice. Okay. Because if anybody's had Randy Dunn's Howell Mountain wines, yeah. this doesn't have the concentration of Randy Dunn's wines, but this has the, what I consider to be the, the tannic structure and the acidity of Howell Mountain. That's awesome. Yes. And it so, is 14.6% alcohol, apparently. So half a percent higher than I thought it was. Which is pretty pretty and right it's on. within two two years of the vintage. Yes. Um, the similar style vintage, right? Because I remember yeah. 16, 18, similar. That's the whole idea. Seven, 17 is a little different. Yeah, what do you think? Do you like it? This is one of our newer, uh, our producer that we've been working with for many years. He um, actually was trained in the Champagne region of France. So that, I thought that was interesting because I think he does do not quite as the same as most Napa producer when it comes to oak treatment. And so, I think that he, coming from Champagne, he picks earlier. Yes. 